when you actually put something out there and you get slapped in the face by your customer, it's quite a sobering thought and it focuses minds like nothing else. And failure's painful. I still, you know, I struggle with it. I've failed so many times. But the faster you fail, the more you can go on to the next thing. And I kept saying the best way to be successful, it is a bit of a numbers game. You have to kiss a lot of frogs. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Ways of Working podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome a fascinating guest today, Colin Duff, the CEO of Mosaic Innovation. Colin is an innovation and cultural transformation consultant with over 20 years of experience helping leading global brands such as Hewlett Packard, Marriott, PepsiCo, Barclays, and the list goes on to crack their toughest innovation challenges. He's going to be sharing today some war stories, actionable insights, and some not so obvious solutions, which are going to help you to innovate and change your culture to be higher performance. Colin, welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me, Jimmy. Colin, when we had our initial conversation, I was struck by the alignment and overlaps that we had when it comes to thinking about innovation of culture and innovation in general. But I, I wanted to pick your brains initially on how you ended up in this world of innovation and working with these incredible brands. Well, it's um, I began my career in an energy company, which certainly wasn't the most innovative in the marketing team. I always felt like I had a um, square peg, a round hole. I was always the one trying to do all these crazy things and they were saying, just go on with your job. And then I stumbled across, I'd never heard there was such a thing, some innovation consultants that came in and I had an absolute ball working with them. And when they were leaving, I said, please take me with you. I really want to join you. And um, after much coercion, they did. And I got to join this really funky agency working on what does the future of vodka look like? How do you sell more Viagra to guys over in Russia? Um, as well as some mundane things like insurance and pensions. And I just found it as a one of me social scientists, I guess, absolutely fascinated to go out, research these subjects. And then again, as at the time, I want to be entrepreneur to actually go and build stuff and make stuff and just really have a lot of fun. Um, and that was really on the, what I'd call inventing site of innovation, the consultant. And I kind of fell into what I characterize the cultural transformation when people started asking me, how did we do what you do? And that manifested in some training. And then actually more recently, about half of our business is an upskilling and it's mainly learned by doing. And I'd say um, what distinguishes us is if you're teaching people well, the training will take you a very small part of the way. Really, it should be indistinguishable a kind of real project from an a cultural development project and that's the thing i see in the market when many people are hired and others it's very happy clappy and it's these people coming in with endless templates and canvases which i have some suspicions about because i think sometimes it's stymies thinking instead of actually showing people what greatness looks like let's say we always attain greatness but that's always the aspiration is to achieve a, an end product that's an innovation rather than just to take people through a kind of fun few days at the office. That's so interesting. And I'm very aligned on the idea of a preordained solution or a preordained template, because as you say, it's, it, it stymies the conversation and the natural organic nature of innovation and cultural shift. When it comes to the companies that you've worked with and what you're seeing in the marketplace right now, how innovative do you think most companies are? So we work almost exclusively with very large enterprises and probably I'd say uncharitably our character is legacy, meaning they weren't born digital. Um, and many of them have been around for decades as well. So it's a mixed picture, to be honest. In parts of the organization, there are some real magic out there. But I guess as an overall, not very innovative. I keep reading stats, like I think 90% of execs are saying innovation's a top priority and almost the same number are really disappointed with the performance. And it's all the stuff you would imagine, the kind of bureaucratic blockers, the slowness, the risk aversion, the myopia, and those are the kind of things that we try and tackle. These big organisations, they're built very well for efficiency, to execute at scale and do very incremental things. As soon as you want to do something where it's harder to quantify the impact or there's a bit of risk, or you can um, 
quantify the market size. If you imagine for Marriott, which is one of her clients, where your BNB was emerging and saying, well, what's the size of the uh, couch, the sofa share market? I mean, practically zero. But if you'd spoke to the people involved at the time, the buzz was incredible. It was palpable. So it's trying to bring in like um, non traditional forms and particularly qualitative data in the early stages. Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel, he says snow always melts at the edges. And it's trying to get them excited and help them distinguish between the noise, because there's so many fans, and some of the, the systemic changes that are happening, which is quite hard to do. Let's, I want to go back. You said something fascinating there. Snow always melts at the edges. What, what does that mean? And how does that apply to what we're talking about here? Well, I guess it's it's the point. I mean, if I give you, um, if this stuff is shown up in the numbers, you've typically missed the boat, certainly in any major innovation. And that's what most large organizations do is they look at the market reports and they scan them and they say, oh, well, there's this emerging sector now. Yeah, you can belatedly get in there through a sub m &E, but by the time you start building for it, someone else is typically in your lunch. So you need to be more switched on to these early stage smoke signals. So great innovation insights are much more like stories than statistics. And I think there's a lot of people in innovation, particularly large organizations at the top, who've came through a quantitative financial background. They've got their MBA, so they're absolute masters of quantitative data assessment, but they've got zero skill in looking at some of these more qualitative and um, non-traditional forms. And there was a, a great strategist for Roger Barton, and he said his best piece of advice for these guys was to do a sommelier course to learn about wine. And he said, why the hell would we do that? And he said, it's because you need to value more that what you can't understand, because wine is quite you know, esoteric and subjective. And that's often what we have to do on innovation and culture. We're actually doing a project just now and part of it, the vast is this culture to look about is this large traditional organization's office. And we interviewed a few colleagues, but some focus groups, and everyone says it's uninspiring, it's stale, it's corporate, it's traditional. But then try to go to a finance committee and say, quantify the impact of us putting it. And you say, well, we can obviously, you know, give you, you want a 30% more productivity and 20% more ideas. You have to actually make a value judgment to say if you want to be a winning tech co, which was, is their aspiration, and you're innovating in this really sterile environment. Well, what do you expect in terms of talent, in terms of output? You know, no wonder no one's staying past five o'clock when you need them all to be hunkered down. So interesting, you know, thinking about. I completely agree with you. Many of the CEOs and the CFOs have come up through either an operations where it's managing the numbers very carefully or a finance where it's managing the numbers extremely carefully background. And so this can create a real resistance to, as you say, the smoke signals. So, so we've got this res quantitative resistance that you say to innovation. What are some of the other barriers that you commonly see that get in the way of organizations innovating? So I... I my, my pet hate actually is there's this culture of idealaholics, as I would call it, and people are confusing the very front end, early stages of innovation and brainstorming with substantive innovation. So I see these people in endless loops of, and they've actually been in instances great at brainstorming and really interesting ideas, but they just don't really know how to make them happen, and it's such a waste of potential. So it's things like the ability to prototype, and they may only have a very small group of people, if it's whether it's digital or physical, who can build things, or it's the ability to run lean experiments. So to have what are big uncertainties of how do we trial them quickly and differently, and that still is interesting design thinking, which is a human-centric approach to design, I'd say most large organizations have got at least some competence on that, maybe a seven out of 10. Lean startup, which is for your more cutting edge breakthrough innovation with high uncertainty. I'd say most of the large organizations I've dealt with up to about a four. Um, it's just not in their DNA to be entrepreneurial. They'll often say, well, we do the, we do what you're talking about. I mean, it only took us six months to test this thing at 100K. And I'm thinking, oh, I was thinking we could have done this in like six days for 600. It's that kind of 10x magnitude where being entrepreneurial is still very difficult. 
I remember working with one client, I'll not name them, we were doing a retail project and we're testing this new in store concept and they said, oh, we can't do it. I said, why is it? Oh, well, the polo shirts haven't showed up, so we were, we can't be branded. I'm like, okay, well, we've got the t-shirt factory down the road, it's right. And also the packaging hasn't arrived, but we can go to a printer and print it. And I think when you've got a lot of people who grew up, as I say, who are very book smart, and uh, maybe they've got their MBA, and there can be almost a snobbishness to innovation or certain executional elements, because often it's not glamorous. The kind of challenges I have, you know, are things like, again, in store, the Wi-Fi doesn't work, or, um, you know, we we'll built this new prototype and didn't know that the browser this company uses because financial services isn't compatible. We need messy workarounds, right? We're having to bring in, go into these like uh, open um, platforms and get somebody to work on overnight. And it's a very different mindset and skill set from someone who sits in an office and does lots of PowerPoint, does lots of Excel, this kind of real world problem solving. Um, as it also meets in customers, and I'm amazed, as another, you talk about barriers, the amount of times talk to large organizations and I'll say to them, when was the last time you met a customer? And I'll say, what do you mean? Like, why would I meet a customer? And I'm like, but you're leading this innovation effort. Oh, well, that's for the market research team. And I'll say, no, that's for you. You should probably be doing it like weekly or, or monthly. And they just don't even know how to access these people. Like, well, how, how would I recruit them? I mean, they might be doing some user testing, so I think that's another big barrier. And if you want to be innovative, you have to be customer-centric. And if you want to be customer-centric, you have to meet customers regularly. And having the mechanisms to do that still doesn't exist. Uh, particularly in B2B, there's a real fear that if people interact with these people, that they might start pulling accounts or being embarrassed. And it's the opposite. Whenever I've met a B2B customer and taken an early stage idea, they're delighted to be engaged. They say we don't usually see this until you've launched it. It's half the time not what we wanted. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what I'm hearing here is there's a, a tension between innovation and maybe risk perception or risk management because we don't want to get it wrong. We don't want to start without the pair of those shirts. We don't want to go without the packaging. We don't want to do that messy, clunky workaround because it's not perfect. Because if I make a mistake, it could be terminal or career limiting. How do you how do you work with if 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 I'm CEO listening to this podcast and I'm thinking, well, I really want to create a culture of innovation in my business, but my people and maybe I am too scared to get it wrong. How do I start that ball rolling with my teams, with my leadership team, and to encourage that appetite for innovation? Yeah, I mean I think that the risk is an interesting one and in that it's it's usually overstated. Now there are a few select industries, healthcare would spring to mind and others like health and safety is at the foreground for, for special situations. But I think the first thing we have to do is actually to quantify the risk. So if we're going to be running a trial, localize it as much as possible, whether that be geographically or um, in one city or town by channel, you want to shrink it down to something that's manageable. And then I always encourage people to think, what is the worst thing that can happen here? So being prepared to compensate customers if the thing doesn't work out or to have some kind of a manual workaround. And the other one as well, and I've seen lots of companies do this really successfully. So First Direct, the bank as an example, or Gillette has even gotten in the act. They'll create a labs brand or a sub brand and they'll actually tell people, this is the innovation engine where we experiment with new tools. And they'll either get a population of customers to opt in and say, do you want to be part of trial and experiment with these new products? Or even just having the brand and saying, okay, you are buying something that's a, a work in progress. So you're going after that more early adopter um, cohort, but a bit more forgiving when things don't work exactly as planned. The other way around it is that there are times when the brand risk really will be quite great. So I can think of a story of um, Volkswagen and they wanted in the early days of um, telematics what they were um, tracking vehicles and doing GPS and things in the uh, lorry market. They didn't want to go public with this in case it failed and competitors stole it. So they actually used Gumtree at the time in the Estates. And they said, we're a startup. We've got this really cool thing. Do you want to try it? We'll give you a couple hundred dollars for participating. So they did it anonymously. And there are instances where you can do that kind of thing. 
or whether it's like a pop-up store as well, there's a platform we've used called Appear here in the UK. So if you want to rent a prime retail store for as little as a week, you can actually get it. It's very like and simple to do signage. And even there's online clients testing new concepts. And I've said, I recommend doing it in a physical format because then you actually get to intercept people and you get the context of the, how they interact with the brand or the proposition. Whereas online, you just get the data. It's uh, not quite as rich when you just find that the people buy it or not. So there are just all kinds of tools and ways you can um, limit things to, to avoid risk. And I, I love that, the idea of actually just getting started with and finding a way to actually learn some practical lessons versus hypothesizing or theorizing. But actually, let's just try some stuff in real life. Yeah. And, and and work around it. But as you say, mitigating the brand risk and the failure risk by doing it in a safe context or a safer context. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's nothing better than getting your hands dirty. So I remember in the shipping industry, we were going to test a bunch of smart IoT products and we were very confident that we knew the technology and we were very smart. And then we got on board and discovered quite quickly the Bluetooth flow energy that was so good doesn't work when there's a bunch of steel around it. The um, sensor we were going to put into a rope, and I'm really embarrassed to admit this, to measure the tension so that we could detect the stacked. Try putting that through a winch and it cracked, right? And it went on and on and on. Oh, explosives test that you didn't think to configure your gear. But fortunately, we'd only spent a few weeks and got these really crude prototypes using off the shelf components. So it wasn't a great waste. But it's the kind of thing that a bunch of smart people, as we thought we were, you could have spent months until you realised, you know, even some of the human behavioural elements as well that you wouldn't think. So again, with the smart rope example, we were envisaging the crew would open up the rope and put this sensor in and wrap something around it. They're telling us, do you know how busy we are? Why would we do that? Right? Or like, it was, you know, small stuff that you just, I, I describe it as thought land. And you can have thought experiments as, as much as you want, and there's some value to that. But until you get in the real world, which is much more messy, you'll never know. And when teams tell me they're in discovery for three months, or they've been working on something for six months with no real world data, it's clear they're lost, right? And that's still the way many teams are operating as, as say, theorists rather than practitioners. I really like that, and it reminds me very much of the the world of the military where I came from, where you had to do rehearsals before you went out and did an operation because there was a plan. We do a, a great deal of planning, create a strategy, brief the plan, and then we go rehearse it. Because as soon as you started rehearsing, you'd be like, "Oh, that person's yeah. not going to reach this point in this time, or something's going to go wrong, or there's a ditch we didn't anticipate, or whatever it might be." And the same thing applies when you're trying to innovate, right? There's things you don't even think of because you haven't thought of them, unconsciously ignorant about them. Yeah, massively so. And, and you're talking about you know desirability. So there's do people want it, and often they do. But viability as well. Like, are they going to pay for it? I remember early in my career innovated for assisted living so elderly people in their home alone they fall over those kind of solutions the trick mats everyone loved it and then we spent months and months developing this thing no one would pay for it so all these adult children in the uk are quite wealthy we're targeting the middle class but because there's a public health care system here everyone's saying well they should pay why would that pay and the public health care system well we are not paying for this innovation and we spent you know, I'm embarrassed to say about nine months just because everyone told us they loved it, but with no real world, you know, tell someone's putting their hand in their pocket for some money, you, you, you've proven nothing. So, interesting. Yeah, that is fascinating, isn't it? There's almost solving a problem that isn't, or a solution for a problem that doesn't exist, and then a solution for a problem that nobody wants to buy. Uh, two different conversations to be having. I'll, I'll give you one of my favorite ever insights was I work so in, um, it was for a big drinks producer and they invented this product called liquid tea so rather than a tea bag they squeezed the tea leaf like you would with wine and made this purified tea and we took this concept we developed in and everyone loved it in this focus group with focus group an hour and a half big insight for me is no one wanted a second cup right this thing was just horrible so it was really clever and it was fresh and it was health and it was that but and it's like 
I think there's a lack of common sense in innovation as well. There's a lot of times I'm seeing very elegant charts about, oh, there's a, um, you know, X opportunity space here and it's all colour coded and stuff. But you always want like, you know, your mum or dad to come in and say like, what are you talking about, right? So I had someone who'd invented this amazing event management platform, bells and whistles, and it was the SaaS product that's going to change the world. They said, there's nothing like it. No competitors like it. I was like, are you kidding? There's Wix, there's Squarespace, there's event space, there's people. Oh, but that doesn't do what we do. And I'm like, that's a really naive assumption, right? It does do what you do. Because you know the intimate, you're an engineer, you've fallen in love with this really sophisticated product. But discovering and events and buying tickets, the market's saturated. Like, but it's just an example of how easy it is to lose perspective. And that's something that I've done several times as well. Is that being an innovator doesn't make you immune. You do fall in love with your own ideas. So there's some really good guardrail parameters that you've suggested there around not falling in love with your own ideas, testing it for viability with other people who might not be experts in your field, might not even be your targeted user base, but could be just a, a ma and pa user that you haven't even considered. But does it is it self-explanatory enough? Is yeah. the innovation obvious enough, simple enough to understand? What are some of the other small wins or momentum builders that you could recommend for leadership teams who are trying to create a culture of innovation? You know, the, there's the kind of quick fix sugar rush stuff. And I know that sounds like a really cynical way to do it, but it does kind of work, right? So if you're looking to galvanize people and build momentum, there is nothing better for a large group of people than a hackathon. So you get people one or two days you give them a sex innovation challenge. So there was a company I worked with in the UK, a retailer called Arcos, and we ran out on how do we win at Christmas? And we had this great idea for a kid's wish list app, which at the time was the first of its kind, and that directly came out with it. And you supercharged, we had about 10 teams of seven people. So there's 70 people who are all just knew we'd set up this digital function. And it just really signaled the attempt, we got the executive in for a kind of a, what we call Dragon's Den or Shark Tank if you're in the UK or we get pitched. So that kind of stuff, it's a momentary thing, but it really builds energy. On a smaller basis team, if you want a more intense a design sprint, which is a method whereby a team of about seven people get together for a week and they develop a solution to a problem. Usually it's a clickable prototype, or it could be a physical thing, and test it in front of customers. Again, the intensity and momentum that builds. I think momentum is the most important thing in innovation. In fact, I used to, when I was um, brought in to look at innovation culture, I used to use one of the very traditional big style consultancy diagnostic tools that loads of questions about leadership capability systems. I stopped doing that and instead I say, give us five of your big innovation projects and I want you to tell me how long they took and I want you to tell me how long you think they should take optimally if you were doing them well. And that for them unpacking the reasons why, there is no better way to understand the dysfunctions in an organization. And it's actually a very um, objective way of doing it because rather than whether a leader's good or not, it's a good way of build coalescing people around. That took a year. Why could we not do that in three months, right? And then you say, well, why can't we? And it's because of what's X, Y, and Z. How do we solve those? So that's the, where I will always start is, you know, I think Eric Lee's, I'm going to forget his quote now, but he says, oh, the fast win. If you're a startup, you've got your funding and you've got your, you know, your runway of X weeks. In a big sleepy organization, you know, you've got infinite time off of, and that's not right. So it's how do you move faster? If the fastest will win. And also, in momentum is kind of self-fulfilling. The faster you go, the more opportunity you get to pivot um, because you spend less money. And just one other related tip as well is the innovation failure rate is typically around about 80%. It depends on the type of innovation and the, the industry, etc. There is no way to bring that down. Even the best innovators, the Googles, the Amazons, etc., will sit around that level. The only thing you can do is to fail faster, right? So it's the only way you'll feel faster as well is, as I say, to get out of fault land. And that includes focus groups and interviews. They're fine in week one, two, maybe even up to week four. But beyond that, do not be too confusing an anecdote for data. And I think most people still do. Oh, they love this, this person, right? 
bring me some skin in the game. What have you did? So if it's B2B, have you got a light in content? If it's consumer, have you got a landing page and smoke tested it with some, you know, paid for paper like advertising? Like, even if you've sold it to friends and family, if you tell me you've got a few hundred people on it, that is at least a positive data point in, in the early stages. But I can't stress it off. It's the biggest um, failure animation I see is people continuing without any real evidence. A canvas we talked at the start is in no way evidence. It's, it's just I just wishful thinking. Yeah, no, I'm so aligned on this idea of, and we see this in culture transformation quite frequently um, when you're trying to innovate culture to become more hyper, a more high performance focus in an organization and everybody agrees in principle, there's a good thing. And then you go roll out all these initiatives and then people are like, oh, I'm actually too busy to do that. There's no skin in the game, as you said, there's no, no commitment to taking on high performance behaviors or ways of working. Instead, they're just wanting something different, but there is no time really and no real desire to change. It's hard to change. Amazing. Colin, um, this has been such an interesting walk through the world of innovation and some, some fascinating stories shared. If people want to get in touch with you and learn a little bit more about what you do, uh, what is the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, so it's uh, mosaic-innovation.com and we've got a bunch of toolkits and brochures so you can see what we're all about and feel free to contact us through the, the website. We'd be welcome conversation. Amazing. And if you uh, were to package up a key takeaway that you want the audience to come away with today, what would that be? You know, I, I think probably this I might have said it before is how do we get out of thought land? If you're sitting around strategizing at workshops and writing PowerPoints, how do you get beyond that and do something a bit more entrepreneurial? And it's if you're not, there's a saying, if you're not embarrassed by your first minimum viable product or the first thing you put out, you've taken too long. So I really always challenge clients when they say, do you know what? You're right, we can do it in three months. I say, what can you do in three days? And, oh, that's ridiculous. Okay, well, five days, right? And, you know, it might be something like really rudimentary, but it's always better to get something quick. There's a certain audacity of zero before you start. It's all this wishful thinking and, you know, grand plans. When you actually put something out there and you get slapped in the face by your customer, it's quite a sobering thought and it focuses minds like nothing else. And failure's painful. I still, you know, I struggle with it. I've failed so many times. But the faster you fail, the more you can go on to the next thing. And I kept saying the best way to be successful, it is a bit of a numbers game. You have to kiss a lot of frogs. If you're doing what two innovations a year, you're going you know, your career. Excellent. Colin, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely fascinating and uh, really appreciate the wisdom you shared with the Ways of Working podcast. Oh, Speak pleasure. to you soon. Thank you, Jimmy. All the best.